Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by future Emmy Award winner for Best Supporting Actor in a Comedic Role, Teddy Hollywood Atlas, fresh off filming with Tracy Morgan in The Last OG. Teddy, how you doing? That is funny, actually. <laughs> that's, a, that is, that's about as close as I get to an Emmy. That's funny. That's comedic. <laughs> yeah, good. Uh, listen, I'm, all I can say is that um, it's, it's nice to be able to be around good people. I always say that. For me, that's where it starts. You know, I mean, the talent, uh, what the person does, what they're known for, okay. But for me, it starts with, is it a decent person? And... Um, Tracy Morgan's a decent person. He's a good person. So uh, it's it's been a blessing uh, to be able to, you know, work on a set with him. I got two more days to do. It was a lot of fun. Nothing but good people. Just uh, what's, what could be better than that? Teddy, I just got one request. When they announce and the Oscar goes to or the Emmy goes to Teddy Atlas that you can at least say, I got to thank my partner, Ken Rideout. Please, at the Oscars, it's the closest I'll get to winning one. Will you mention me if you win it? Um. Yeah, I will. I, I, uh, <laughs> Since I, you asked, I, I I do that. I do that. But um, <laughs> you know, it, it it's just been fun. And like I said, it's uh, I'm around good people. It's uh, he he's a he's a you don't know till you know somebody till you're around them. You know, you just see everything else. He's a special person. It's good. I saw you with Tracy and Mark Breland, another good person. Yeah, Mark's Mark is sort of the. As they say, salt of the earth, you know, kind of like what you would say about a Mickey Ward, you know, just a good, solid person, you know, and we, you know, we can never be around enough good people. So, uh, you know, I got it just before I let you take it in the direction that we're going to take this podcast. Obviously, the main thing is the Canelo fight. Uh, we'll get to that. But uh, I just want everyone to know that I'm okay. I'm I'm healed up. My um I'm not burping anymore. I got over the humble pie that I had to eat. You know, I use this stuff. It's good. It's, I've been drinking it. I've been drinking a lot of this stuff. I know we don't have advertisers for it yet, but we'll get them probably. We'll be we're sending them an invoice, don't worry. Yeah, we should. <laughs> we, we really should. But um this is this has got me through eating that um horrible humble pie. Uh, everybody should try it though. Every once in a while, a little humble pie. It's it's. It, I don't know if it's good for your diet. I don't know if it's good for your bowels. Um, you know. Uh, but I I know one thing. It's it, it's probably good for your soul. Uh, to be to be checked a little bit every once in a while. So I'm good. I'm not burping anymore. I got it out of my system. Uh, and I came back strong with being right on the button with Canelo. That's all right, right on this right you're right on the screws and we'll get into exactly what you were right about because we talked about a lot of different angles. I just want to thank Canelo and this and this for getting me through what I had to deal with with the indigestion and some of the other things that we really shouldn't be talking about on the show. I think that people would rather us, you know, kind of leave that uh, alone. Okay? Let's go. All right. Hey guys, quick break to give a shout out to today's sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Brave, the privacy browser. Other browsers don't respect your privacy. Brave is different. They've built better privacy into a much faster browser. It's three times faster than Chrome with a much better layout and experience. I genuinely love this product. I switched all my computers in the house, my wife's, mine, the kids, to all use Brave. Chrome and some of the other browsers, they track everything you do. You get hit with ads. You notice if you're looking for someone to clean your gutters, you'll get hit with like 25 gutter ad cleaning ads for the next two weeks. It, it, don't take my word for it. Just pay attention to what's going on. With Brave, you don't have to worry about that. Brave automatically blocks big text trackers and intrusive ads that slow you down, drain your battery, and track you from site to site, and again, hit you with those creepy ads that follow you around the web. With Brave, no one, not even Brave, sees what you're doing online. So head over to brave.com slash atlas to join 30 million people who've upgraded to the privacy browser for free. Again, there's nothing, you don't, you don't have to do anything. Just download the browser, brave.com, use the promo code atlas so they know we directed you there. It helps the site, it helps the show. I mean, there's no ask here. Use their browser and they won't track you. 
Give it a try. You've got nothing to lose. Switch in under 60 seconds by going to brave.com slash atlas. You'll be doing us a favor and I guarantee you'll have a better experience browsing the web. Today's episode is also brought to you by Athletic Greens. If you listen to the show, you know we've been on this train for a long time. It's one of my favorite products. It's the one thing that I take every single day without fail. This is no BS. I legitimately use it every single day. It's the ultimate all-in-one supplement for the body with 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients. It includes prebiotics, probiotics, digestive enzymes, aptogens, superfoods, and more. Like I said, I love this stuff. I um, celebrated my 50th birthday last weekend by winning the Myrtle Beach Marathon, approximately 3,000 people. I beat them all, not my age group, not the masters. I, I won the whole race. And I credit a lot of my success athletically to Athletic Greens because training and um, working hard is only part of the battle. You've gotta make sure you're taking care of the engine and putting in the best fuel possible. Go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas to get 10 free Athletic Greens travel packs with your first purchase. Again, athleticgreens.com slash atlas to get 10 free servings of Athletic Greens. Check them out, athleticgreens.com. All right, let's jump into it. Let's start on the undercard with potentially one of the most egregious refereeing uh, bad calls we've seen in a while. There's a lot of them, but this one was particularly terrible. Like, let me just set this up for, for people who might not know who uh, Takeyama is. He's been around for a long time. He came into the fight at 32 and 8. He's 37 years old. He's a four-time minimum weight champion. The guy has been around. He went, he tried, to, he's been off for five years. His last fight was in December of 2020. He tried to make a run at making the Japanese Olympic boxing team. For those who don't know, pros are welcome to jump in. Very different styles of boxing. Pros typically haven't had the easiest transition trying to go backwards to amateurs. That's another story. Nevertheless, they picked this guy, the Soto camp at 18 and one. Soto's 24 years old. They picked this old wily veteran from Japan. They give, they give him a one month notice. So the fight starts. Soto's taking it to him pretty good. He's piecing him up. But slowly, Takeyama, I think, is starting to get into the fight. He's starting to look better and better. And, and late in the ninth round, Soto was getting to him a little bit and landing some good shots. But Takeyama was never down, never looked hurt, got rocked a few times, but didn't look hurt. He was answering back with punches. And right at the end of the ninth round, Soto lands a nice combination. The ref jumps in and stops the fight. Like, oh my God, there's the potential. This Takeyama is getting into a rhythm. Maybe he comes back and lands something and upsets the apple cart and the ref waves it off. If ever there was an argument to be made for corruption, it has to be made here. There was no reason to stop that fight, but I'm going to turn it over to you. You have your, your opinion matters much more here. You've seen a lot more. I just, I can't understand why they stopped this fight other than the thought of Soto losing to this guy was too overwhelming. Keep in mind, the one fight he did have five years ago was a six rounder that he won by decision. So they thought they had this guy primed to take a beating. What'd you see? No, I saw him, get, listen, in all fairness, I'll, I'll go down and x-ray the whole thing. That's what we try to do here and give all the sides. Um, he was getting hit a lot of clean shots. He was he was, Fair. He, he was busy. He was the guy who was busy, kept throwing, you know. He was the uh, little engine that could, you know. He just kept chugging and chugging and chugging, um, you know, and, and kept throwing. And no matter what he got hit with, he, he spit right back at the guy. Um but he was getting hit the cleaner punches and solid punches. And just before the stoppage, he, he once again got hit clean, solid punches. And the referee, if we're going to take him, you know, if we're going to take him earnest, uh, at his earnest that he's a f fair, you know, good ref, and he's a very experienced ref, obviously, but if we're going to take it that he's a fair ref and that he's uh, a just ref and a just human being, you could say, well, he saw him taking a lot of punishment all night, and finally, you know, he stopped it, kind of like Eddie Fudge when he stopped the fight with Joe Frazier in the 14th round. Uh, with uh, what, what, that was the what was that the thrill in Manila? Was that the one? Yeah, the thrill in Manila. What a fight! Oh my God, it was uh, so much of themselves were left uh, in the ring in that fight. But Eddie Fudge, the great Eddie Fudge, he's not with us anymore. But he stopped in the 14th. Uh, after 
Frazier had taken a lot of punishment. It was back and forth. Ali took a lot of punishment. Ali later on said to Sports Illustrated, it was the closest thing I felt to death. Um, but he found a way to... Uh, that's why Ali was Ali. In the 10th round, when Frazier came back after Ali, it was Frazier, it was Ali, it was Frazier, it was Ali, it was Ali, it was Frazier. It was back and forth. And in the 10th round, Ali said he actually thought, like, I can't go on. Like, like, this is too much. I can't. But what did he do when the bell rang? He went on. So that's what the great ones do. They find a way. And I think that's, I think that's going to play into what we get into Canelo later. So I felt that I needed to mention that. Because it's going to play into the theme of what we're going to be talking about in a little while. About the main fight uh, with Canelo. Uh, and, of course, Saunders. But he... So you can make the argument that he was compassionate. That Eddie Futch, you know, said that's enough. You could also say, wait a minute, he was taking punishment all night long. What's another round? But it, but that could be wrong because sometimes all it takes is another round. So you can look at it both ways. So if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna be, again, judging the referee that that he's an honest man, um, and he's not a corrupted man in any sort of way that you touched on. I'm going to say he saw him taking punishment all night. Yes, he handled it. Yes, he came back. But finally he said, do I want him to keep taking the punishment, you know, uh, for for X amount of rounds more that I've seen him already taking? I'll stop it now. He's taken enough. So I, I it's plausible. Um, do I think he should have stopped it? If you, you say, Teddy, you you presented both sides, but do you think he should have stopped No. No, I, I, I really probably would have let it go. But, um, but I can see that as the argument. Lawrence Cole, he came up as a young ref. His father used to be the commissioner, Dickie Cole. I don't know. I don't think he's, God bless him. I don't think he's with us anymore. But he was a powerful guy in, in Texas. And see, I'm going to put a little more color on it than, than maybe the average person would know about it. But when I was doing the Friday night fights, we did a lot of fights in Texas. And Lawrence Cole was always the ref. For, for the ESPN fights. You know why? Well, his father was the commissioner. Mm -hmm. So, of course, his son is going to be the ref. So, so he was a privileged guy. I think that's fair. I'm not knocking him. We had our differences. Full transparency. Me and Lawrence had our differences. I attacked him on ESPN, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 18 years ago. I don't remember exactly. But I thought he was stopping fights too soon. And, and I, I, I wasn't sure why. I mean, I wasn't sure why, and and I attacked. Did he ever, him. I, did, did he ever stop an A side fighter too early? That's my question. Listen, that's a question that the fans would want, and that's a question that you were smart to just ask. Um, I I don't want to answer it because I don't. I want to be a hundred percent sure. I would I would tend to say maybe not, maybe not, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go there completely but i where i am going because that's what we do on the show is give you everything we can give you is that i had a problem with him and we it was on espn it was on national tv where week after week or month after month when we visited texas which we did they did a lot of boxing we were there with espn uh I, I was critical of him at the times I thought I needed to be critical. Here's something I'm going to throw in here, and I'm going to throw it in the right way because you can't libel somebody. You can't just say, oh, you yeah, you got to be responsible. You got to be responsible. So I'm going to, I'm going to for full disclosure, I'm going to say I don't remember exactly what the terms were and exactly who the ref was. I don't know that it was Lawrence Cole. I don't for sure. But I remember a situation where a referee, and it may have been in Texas, and it may have been Lawrence, it may not have been, but we were doing fights and the referee was stopping them too fast. So I started looking into it because I really, I told you this a long time ago, I felt my platform, if I could do more than collect a check, if I could look out for the fans, if I could maybe make the sport a tiny bit better, I'm no savior, I'm no knight on a shining horse, I know that. But I felt if I could do more than collect a check, if I could once in a while maybe help the sport a little bit, clean it up a little bit, um, it doesn't have a national commission, it does need help, if I could maybe look out for a fighter, 
once in a while. Um, I did I did something that I'm privileged to be in a position to do, that I felt a responsibility that I should do if I could. And so I looked into some stuff, and at that time, all the fights had to be insured. There had to be an insurance carrier that's carrying the fights. I looked into it with some help from friends, and I found out, I can't remember the name of the carrier. It started with a G. Um, but there was a carrier um, that was being used all the time in these fights in this area that I'm talking about, okay? And it was the same carrier for the insurance. And it turns out that, God forbid, there is a fatality. There's a serious injury. Obviously, the insurance, you know, that's when insurance would have to make good on it, right? Yes. That's when the insurance would obviously have, you know, uh, a liability to, uh, you know, uh, have to pay off um, for some. And, and you pray that you don't get that. And unfortunately, I've been in the business so long, I have seen, I have seen those situations, unfortunately. Um, it's a tough sport, just like football. It's just like UFC or uh, MMA. But... um and that's why I'm so that's that's why I'm so strong about this stuff. I've said it before. When a fighter gets robbed, they got to go back in the line and face a thousand punches again to get back to that place they were. Um, it, it's it's not like a baseball player who gets robbed going to first base and and you say he's out when he was really safe. He's gonna get up again the next the the next inning. And he could he could rectify things. But a fighter got to go back in line and he might have to wait another year to get back to that place. Or he might never get back to that place where he's gonna be a step closer to getting out the door, to taking care of his family, to doing all the things that we all want to do. So anyway, this insurance carrier. I started thinking, why is this guy always stopping fights early? It turned out that he was he was a part owner in some way, in some way. And listen, the stuff's out there. If we had to find it, we'd find it. But I'm again, I'm not, I'm not saying anything here with this. I'm just making a scenario that at that time was real. That the the insurance company was there was a relation between the referee. And the insurance company. That's a conflict. That's start thinking about that. That's dangerous. That's slippery. That you talk yeah, about for insurance slippery. company to provide that coverage, they would need someone who understands the sport and can underwrite the risk. So it would make sense that they would have those kind of people on their advisory board helping them to price this stuff. And what better way to guarantee you don't have a fatality than to have well, a representative from the company in the ring to say, up, up, this is getting crazy. See, yeah, you this took guy it. might get hurt. I gave you the ball. You took it across the finish line. Uh, you took it across the goal line. And that was the thing that started getting dicey. Like this referee, whoever it was, whoever it was, there was, a re there was a connection with the insurance company. And I started looking into it and I went on the end. I said something because, because it, it shouted at me. It, it, it shouted at me like there's something wrong here. You shouldn't have a referee, you talk about conflicts, involved with an insurance company in the sport that he's refereeing. And as you said, if it gets dicey and you want to protect the insurance company from not being you know, liable to, to pay off a big suit, you stop the fight. So that, listen, people are going to hear this podcast and... It's going to go out there. People are going to say, wow, wow, holy shinolis. That's the word, right? Holy shinolis. Um, people are going to, you know, holy sh sugar. Like, this is really, wow, Teddy, that stuff shouldn't exist. That, that closeness, that conflict, that intertwining in these kind of things that we're talking about should not intertwine. They should not. So that's the problem with boxing. Without a national commission, that kind of stuff, you think that stuff could happen in the NFL or the NBA? No, no, no. It's vetted. There's somebody vetting that, looking at that, making sure that there, there is no connections like that. And my man Ken, that's why he's my man. He's looking out now for us, and he's looking on that computer, and he's trying to... He's trying to trace some stuff down, track some in stuff 2010, down. In 2010, Lawrence Cole did an interview. He owns Cole Insurance Company, and he says in the interview 
that they asked him about his insurance involvement and he said that um, I got into I got into the insurance business in 1992 writing standard stuff life home blah 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 and I realized there was only one agent writing special spectator liability insurance for boxing matches so I started doing that and that's been a great niche market now I write insurance for all kinds of events in concert I covered a snowboarding exhibition in downtown Miami blah 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 point is he's your man he's he, he he's involved not only in insurance, but writing insurance on events. Now, it doesn't say if he's covering the fighters. It mentions spectator insurance. But if he's writing the insurance for the event, I would think that the people involved in the event on all levels would want to know that his company is writing the insurance for the event, whether it's for the fighters. Or, but if you're in, in the ring controlling the action, I would think that would be a relevant topic to be disclosed on air. Just so you know, the referee is uh, writing the insurance on this fight. <coughs> I'm sorry. No, I mean that would uh, that would uh, that would kind of upset me a little bit. I think maybe. I mean, it would. I mean, that would shock most people if if they that, heard that. That article is on the Advocate uh, in Lakewood slash East Tele uh, East Dallas. The website, if anyone wants to look it up, is Lakewood dot Advocate Mag dot com. Advocate Magazine. Lakewood dot Advocate Advocate Mag dot dot com if you'd like to like check our research i just pulled that up on the internet and if you go back i would go back if you really want to get deep and do the sherlock holmes thing i would go i would go back a few more years i would go back a few more years and and follow it and see um if if he ever was really involved with maybe a different insurance company that maybe he was a part owner of part owner maybe maybe or some he kind of a full owner of this one i know i'd go back and see was there an affiliation with another firm or another insurance carrier um where they actually were insuring fights that he actually was a referee in that's it that's what you're looking for that's and again i'm not it sounds like you're onto something i'm just saying uh Somebody out there, if we still have a, if we still have any real journalists out there, I don't know if we do, but there's a few. I shouldn't say that. I really shouldn't. I just get down sometimes, like because sometimes we, they, they just, you wish that somebody would do a better job in some of this stuff and protecting the sport, protecting the fighters, you know, or whatever element of it is that needs to be looked at that somebody would do it and sometimes you wonder why don't they do it why don't they look at these things why and i don't know is it because they have an agenda and they don't want to they want to be friends with everybody you know get along to go along go along to get along um they they don't want to ruffle anyone's feathers because they're making money because they're in the industry yeah that is the reason sometimes sometimes uh, not all the times there's guys out there that are better than that I just wish we could see more of them. But again, it's no, I'm, I'm not making an accusation. I'm not, I'm just saying that I know that what I just explained and described uh, was part of my life and experience years ago at Friday Night Fights. And um, that was the situation. That's, that's all I can tell you. One thing that I want to ask your opinion on with regards to the stoppage is all the things you said were fair. He was getting touched up and he was getting banged around and he's an older guy. All very fair. However, I would argue this is a world title fight. The guy's only been stopped once. Just so you know, the last time he was stopped, 2003. He's a, there, so here are some of the things that I think would have been considered by the ref in anticipation of something like this. And you can correct me if I'm wrong. These guys are fighting at almost a minimum weight. They're not exactly known for knocking guys' heads into the fifth round like a heavyweight or a cruiserweight. So there's that. The guy's a wily veteran. We saw Nonito Denaire, Chris Ariola. The list goes on and on of older guys that have like shown up one night and put on a great performance relative to what was expected from them. The guy, like I said, he hadn't been knocked down. He's been around a long time. He was starting to get into a groove. Fair, he did just take a bunch of punches there. But I didn't think at any point, like, oh, my God, I'm in fear for this guy. He's getting killed. All of those things I would think should be considered. Now, if it was a six-round fight and the guy had three fights, then maybe you could be like, yeah, listen, this guy's out of his depth. But this guy's a four-time champion. He's proven that he can, like, get it done at the highest level. And Soto at times looked good, but Takeyama was also landing as well. Maybe not big punches, but those are things that I thought that the ref 
would have considered in anticipation of something like this and, and, and at least said, I mean, the guy hasn't even been down. It's not like he was like on stiff legs and doing like the crazy dance. He was, I don't know. Here's what my you, rebuttal. Here's my yeah. rebuttal to that. And that's all good points. What you're using can be used against you. What do I mean by that? Yep. The argument you're using is, hey, he's been around. He's an experienced guy. He's been in tough fights. Um, you give him a chance. He's proven he can get out of it. Well, that could be used against your argument because since he has been in those tough fights and he does have those miles on the odometer and he does have those punches that have basically rung the cash register, if you will, and 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 uh, a, a part of him now where it's, it's impacted him. He's more vulnerable now. So you can make the argument against what you said. The same as you can make it for. You made a good argument. But you can say, that's why I have to look at it closer. He has been in a lot of wars. He has been in a lot of tough fights. He has been around a long time. And at this point, he's not the same as he was five years ago. At this point, because of all those tough fights, I have to be more careful and I have to be more diligent if you will uh, or, 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 or vigilant if you will with this um, where I have to understand that now he's more vulnerable because he has been in those tough fights and you can't assume that he can overcome what he overcame five years ago when he was younger. So that could be the argument and, and that's, that's a fair argument that you could come back to. Another argument could be it's not just that he handled those punches during the night, that he took them, he absorbed them, and then he came back like the energy bunny, you know, that just kept going. But it's what impact that they have, the accumulation, because that's where fighters get hurt, where it's an accumulatory effect. It's not the one shot. See, here's the argument you could make, that a guy gets knocked cold, bang! And you say, oh my God, that could damage him. But you could also say no. It's not because it was one punch, it's over. He doesn't take any more punches and maybe it happened early in the night. But when a guy takes and takes and takes and takes for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, whatever amount of rounds, the accumulation, that's where the damage can be occurred. And that's where the damage can show. And that's where we can get into real serious situations with the health of a fighter. So you do have to be you do have to be cognizant of the accumulatory effect on a fighter. It, it, it's real. Would you take into consideration, though, that this is at light flyweight, so maybe those punches weren't... Now, if, it, if they were at cruiserweight and he was getting hit like this, maybe that's a different story. My argument to you, it's a good... Again, good case. You're a good lawyer. But I would come back on the other side of the defense or the prosecution whatever side i'm on. i don't even know what side i'm on i'm, I'm you know i'm not burping anymore i'm finished with that but <laughs> I, I, i'm I, I get confused with other things sometimes but i would come back and say everything's relative it doesn't matter if he's a cruiserweight or lightweight he's still getting hit with a guy his size who can punch at his size yeah does the in in re relative relatively does the flyweight or the junior flyweight punch like a heavyweight no of course not but he's hitting a junior flyweight or a flyweight so uh it's all relative it's significant to the guy he's hitting because he's able to produce power at a flyweight and power at a flyweight is power at a flyweight it has its consequences it has its you know it, it has its effect on a flyweight obviously it would not, not have an effect on a cruiserweight or a heavyweight. So I, I would say no, that it doesn't matter. It's all relative. And the guy's still taking clean punches. That's what matters. And he's being impacted by those clean punches. His knees are being wobbled. He's going back. Then he's coming back. That And, and again, you look at his resume, as you said before, and his resume tells you, he's, you know, he's he's got a lot of miles on that odometer. Listen, I'll finish by saying this. There are, uh, and, and I don't know if it's in defense of Lawrence Cole or just in fairness, there are referees that are known. That it's their style. It's, it's, it becomes just like a fighter's style, a fighter's personality, you know, is, is sort of preset to be a certain way. You know, the way you talk, the way you act, the way you react to things, the way you respond to things. It's part of your temperament. Well, there's referees out there that part of their style, part of their makeup, for whatever reason, is to stop fights too soon or too late. 
There's guys, there's, there's the other side of the ledger where there's guys that stop fights too late. And, and it's just been what they do. It's just part of how they look at things, part of how they, they, they you know, they think it should be done in, in, their, in their position uh, for what it is, that you should wait and wait, and sometimes people criticize them. You waited too long. And then there's the guys like Lamas Cole who have been criticized and have had a track record of stopping fights too soon. So some of it could be attached to what we talked about. It's always possible. But some of it could be not attached to any of that. It could be simply that that's their belief, that that's their style, that that's how they do it. Well, the last the last thing I'll say is it's a title fight. The guy hadn't gone down. I agree he was getting hit, but I never thought that, oh, my God, I'm in fear for Takeyama's safety. I thought it was premature. But nevertheless, I, I agree with everything you've said. I still think that Lawrence Cole was a little too early there. Um, let's get into the uh, main event. That's what everyone's here for. Canelo lived up to all the uh, expectations, in my opinion. Uh, the referees had Canelo ahead by a couple rounds at the time of the stoppage. Um, I would say stop between, uh, I believe, the eighth and the ninth round. Um, I could have given maybe maybe two or three rounds to Billy Joe, but I, I, when I looked at that fight going in and I saw some of the commentators had um, uh, Billy Joe ahead by two or three rounds at one point, I said... It went okay, nine rounds. Didn't he get stopped in the ninth? I just want to make sure we're correct the, on that. In between the eighth and the ninth, I believe. I'll I thought he got talking. stopped in the ninth. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the point is, when I looked at the, when I watched that fight without scoring it, I know if if I had to choose, who would I rather be in that fight? It's Canelo. Canelo looked like he was the boss of the ring. He was t taking his time, figuring him out. Billy Joe was moving nicely. He had some decent moments. I never thought he landed anything of significance on Canelo. Canelo had like barely any marks on his face at the end of eight rounds at super middleweight. You would think both guys in eight rounds would, have, would be marked up. Canelo eventually lands the huge uppercut in the eighth round and damages the eye badly. I'm seeing reports this morning that he has multiple orbital fractures. Um, has that been has that been verified by X-rays? Because it's one thing uh, for a promoter unless they to say, post the X. Yeah, yeah unless yeah. they post the X-rays, I'm going to assume that until we see evidence. It's TBD. To well, be that's determined. that's right. You're right, Ken. It's so important. Of course, he's gonna say. Of course, he's gonna say he has a broken orbital bone. Well, he not only that, the promoter too. Uh, that's a, so. I'm not calling Tom, uh, Hearns a liar, but it's it's easy afterwards to say he broke his face because I think that was one of the quotes. All uh, right, he got his face broke. All right, you could say that, but is it literal? Is it literal? Did he literally get his face broke? Or is that just a term that we use, you know, and, and flippantly, where you could just say, hey, he broke his face. Uh, but did you do an x-ray to see if there's actually a break in the bones? I don't know 100%. that. Yeah, I don't know that we've gotten that proof yet. And I want our yeah. audience to know that. Uh, until you got that proof, you could say anything. But until you got that proof. As soon as he didn't come out, you knew that there was going to be, he had a broken orbital bone, a ruptured spleen. Like, take your pick. He, had to, he has to have a reason for not coming out of the But he doesn't know it's broke. He doesn't know it's exactly. broke. Exactly. No one does. He just knows his eye. I mean, his eye was damaged, clearly. But you could see him doing that thing, you know, when the he ref. Was, the he was in a distressful situation that, guess what, Ken? That's, that's part of the world for fighters. At one exactly. point or another, you're going to be in that world. It's a world of distress. It's a world of pain. It's a world of agony. It's a world of, of threat. It's a world of, of risk. It's a world of, of fear. It's a world of, of danger. Uh, it's a world that you might not ever be the same again. Yeah, that's the reality. That's the reality. And listen, I'm not knocking anybody for stopping it. The fighter, the, I'm not. I'm not. Get that clear, people. I'm not knocking a corner. You're looking out for your fighter. If that's what they felt, they don't have an x-ray machine, so in the corner, last I checked. So, But if that's what they felt, obviously they're not going to stop it unless the fight is going along with it. Get that clear. Get that clear. I've been in this business 45 years. Billy Joe was doing that thing, if you notice, if you watch closely, and I've seen this before, where the doctor's trying to, or the doctor or the trainer's trying to look in the eye, and they're trying to pull it over, and you can see that the, eye, the, the fighter is squeezing as tight as he can, like, no, I can't open it, and maybe there was, it was irritated, but... It opened, it closed, it opened, it closed. But when they're trying to look at it, can you see, you could tell that he was basically saying like, 
No, I can't see whether he uttered those words. But as soon as you say you can't see, you know the fight's over. Nevertheless, Canelo hit him with that one big shot. It was in the eighth round. Billy Joe doesn't answer the bell. And right away, I, I always hesitate to say anyone quits. Um, but, I mean, the British fans, I know they're going to be angry about this more at Billy Joe than anyone. And one of my friends, a British fan, huge fan, Keith Garrity, said to me, yeah, Billy Joe quit. It's almost like they were off the Billy Joe, the Billy Joe bandwagon. As soon as he quit, oh, as soon as he didn't answer the bell, my God, did the tide shift. I mean, Billy Joe painted himself into a corner by talking all that, you know, uh, a proud fighting man, traveler. I'm a gypsy. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm willing to die in there. I'm willing to die, but I will not fight with a broken orbital bone. That's too much for if me. If it's broken, Death. if it's broken, if it's broken. Yes. Well, all we know is a swollen eye right now. That's exactly. all we know. Exactly. But, but hey, he might have been broken. Even if it was, he'll fight to the death in the, pre, in the lead up to the fight. But death is trumped by a sore eye, whether it's a broken bone or whatever. Apparently, the broken eye trumps death. That's too much to answer the bell. And listen, I'm not a fighter. I don't get paid to get punched in the face, so I'm not trying to be critical of this guy. I admire everything that what they do. They're physically tough guys. But when you sign up for this, you're a world champion. You're fighting on this level. You're expected to answer the bell. You're going to get punched in the face. You might get cut. You're expected to fight through that. On the rare occasions when guys don't, it becomes a huge topic, and to this date, as we've talked about on the show before, Roberto Duran can't be mentioned without mention of the Nomas fight. It will haunt him forever, and I have a feeling that this is going to be Billy Joe's signature fight, and this is going to be, this is never going to go away, and it's much more painful to live with this than to continue with the damaged eye. What'd you think? All right, listen, the argument, I wanted you to, I didn't want to interrupt you, and I didn't. Um, the argument really, that some people are going to make is, hey, hey, guys, health is more important than wealth. You know, I've heard that they use that term, whatever. It sounds, it sounds cool, I guess. Um, and we're not just talking about the moment. We're talking about maybe, it, maybe if you go on and it's a broken orbital, maybe he becomes blind. Maybe you're doing permanent damage. Maybe his career is destroyed because he fought the rest of those rounds instead of not fighting and, you know, uh, surviving and fighting another day or quitting and fighting. Uh, I hate to use that word, but uh, it is what it is. He, he did at the end. W whether you like it or not, whether you like it or not, whether he was right or wrong, we're not arguing that right now. We're not arguing that. Get that clear. People, get that, get the cotton out of your ears. Understand. We're not arguing right now. What we're saying is there's no getting around that he made a decision to say, no, I'm not going on. Okay, he made a decision to let his corner do that. Now, you could argue that it's the right decision for him, that his health is more important, that if he went on, it turns out maybe a bone would have went somewhere else into the retina. We don't know. We're, 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 we're making these fantastic, uh, you know, uh, uh, assumptions of speculation that something could have possibly happened that, Maybe he's blind, or maybe, again, his career has ended because the fight wasn't stopped, because he went on with a broken bone. Maybe, maybe. That's his choice. That's, that's his choice. But there are men out there in this business that make a choice not to think of that. You could call them stupid, or you could call them warriors, gladiators, champions, iconic, whatever. It's up to you. That's your choice. And you can make an argument both ways. I say it again. That, hey, health is more important than wealth. That, you know, we stop it so he can fight another day. All right. But there's guys that don't. Ali, when he got his jaw broken against Norton. And I'm just putting it out there. I think it was in the second round in the first Norton fight. He got his jaw broken. I mean, well, it was going like this. Your jaw is not, suppo uh, 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 not supposed to go like that. I couldn't even eat humble <laughs> pie right now if I had a broken jaw. I, 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 I couldn't do that. So, and, and, you try, and Al, though. No, you would, I would try. try. I would try. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> I would. I try. I would try. And oh, I try like hell. I'm not letting you guys get the better of me out there. I, I would try <laughs> like hell. And, and he, he went on. He fought 10 more rounds with a broken jaw. He lost the fight. But you know what? He didn't lose something else. He didn't lose his 
ability to know that he could overcome almost anything, even a broken jaw. He didn't lose what was important to him, to know that he did not, did not give in. He did not give in even to a broken jaw, that, that he could always count on himself. And that was important to him. And it was important to us. You know why? That's why we talk about Ali all these years later. That's one of the reasons why. That's one of the reasons that built, that creates this 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 gladiator, this this superhuman person of Ali. That's part of it. That's part of he earned the right to be thought of in these terms by truly earning the right, by making that choice. And people could say, oh, that was stupid. He could have, his jaw could have been disformed. Well, that was his choice because something else could have been disformed. Yeah. His soul, his heart, his spirit, that could have been disformed for him, for him. And it was more important for him that that wasn't disformed. It was more important that, yeah, he might lose cartilage in his jaw, but he wasn't going to lose cartilage anywhere else. Okay. You have to understand that. You have to understand what goes into it. You know, when when Sugar Ray Leonard, and I think he's one of the greatest fighters ever. I love Sugar Ray Leonard. He's one of my favorites. I think he fits in with any any era. When he was fighting Tommy Hearns in that iconic fight, the first fight, when they were both in their prime, you very rarely see great fighters in their prime fighting each other. That was what was great about the 80s. Besides, it was on national TV, network TV, not on, on just cable, not on pay-per-view. You got to see these guys. And they fight the, the best fighting the best when they were the best. And do you remember that? You remember that pig? Rob, my man Rob's going to get it up for you. But where he's looking out from his corner and his eye is like a pea, like this, Ken. This is his eye, like a pea. Like, like he can't open his eye. Now, did he know if he had a broken orbital bone? He might have. He might have. I know that, I don't remember exactly when, but I know that sometime after that he had a detached retina. Maybe he detached his retina in that fight. That could have meant that he could have become blind. That's what it could mean. It could mean that. It could mean. We have a great science, great you know, medical abilities to fix things now. So, of course, you can reattach it with lasers and all that stuff. Years ago, it probably would have meant you were blind. But now, of course, we, we, we have such you know, great, great ability to, to, to do things uh, medically that, that you, you can fix a retina. But... I remember Leonard, I don't remember if it was attached to that, but sometime after that, he wound up retiring with a detached retina. He had surgery, he, he thought his career was done, and then he came back. He wound up making a decision to come back. But when that eye was closed, and he was in there with Tommy Hearns, the hitman, Oh, the, oh my God. Uh, the, the, you know what I mean? I mean, the guy could punch like hell. What a, I mean, Hearns was a great fighter. And he's in there with Tommy Hearns and his eyes like this. And he's looking out from the corner. And they, it, was, it was an iconic picture. And you saw it. And he's looking like this. And he made a decision. He wasn't thinking about the orbital bone. He wasn't thinking. It could have been broke. The retina could have been detached. He did wind up with a detached retina later in his career. So maybe, I don't know if it was uh, connected. But he was thinking about one thing. One thing alone. I got to go get this guy. I, I got to behave like a fighter. I got to behave like a champion. I, I, nothing is more important. Now, some people could say that's foolish. You could, you could be blind or you could do something where you could die. Yeah, but you know what their answer would be? I'll die on my terms. I'll die the way I want. I'll go blind where that one day, that one day in my life, I was the greatest. I was the greatest. I was the best. I found a way when someone else wouldn't find a way. I conquered. I would not be conquered by a broken bone, by a person, by anything. And listen, does everyone have that mentality? No. But, and is it always right? Hey, I don't know. It's right for them, though. It's right for Ali. It was right for Sugar Ray Leonard. It was right for Carmen Basilio when he had an eye closed like a cyclops against the greatest fighter. Most people say the greatest fighter of all time, maybe the greatest puncher of all time, Sugar Ray Robinson. All right? He had a, one eye, and he had to go 15 rounds with one eye. And he, he didn't even think about 
Matter of fact, afterwards, I still remember the great quote. When the newspaper was the biggest sport in the country at that time, bigger than baseball. When the newspaper guys all swarmed in on him and say, Carmen, Carmen, would you have been able to win that fight and make a difference if you didn't have that eye closed? Would it have made a difference, Carmen? You know what Basilio said? Uh, no. Oh, no? No. I had another eye. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, there was nothing wrong with that eye. Now that I was working fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, that's the mentality. Can I tell that, you one, one quick thing is that a lot of people can't relate, but a lot of people don't sign up to like get into a, a face punching contest. You you know you're gonna get hit. Like I'm gonna expected. say one other. Let me say one other because you brought it up. You're the one who reminded me last time we did the podcast. In a way, in a way, had a fractured orbital bone, I believe. We can look it up. You can look it up. It's right there. I believe he had a real fractured orbital bone in the fight. And you talked about it. To your credit, you didn't talk about that, but you talked about how Donaire, the old champion, the former champion, fought an unbel... He brought back his youth. He turned the clock back, and he and he fought an unbel... Kind of like Chris Ariola, who made me eat humble pie. He turned the clock back. Donaire turned the clock back and he fought an unbelievable fight with who I think is maybe the pound for pound best fight in the world at least one of the top three the undefeated fighter from Japan in a way and he fought an unbelievable fight Donaire and in a way if I'm correct he, it turned multiple out multiple fractures multiple fractures there it is there it is exhibit A exhibit B exhibit C I rest my case no but listen I understand again that doesn't mean that's right for everybody. But that was right for Inouye. That was right for Inouye because for Inouye, anything less than finding a way to win is a loss. It's, I mean, a loss personally. Like, you didn't find a way? You stopped because your eye was closed? You stopped because your eye was swollen? No. No, because that's part of what these fighters sign up for. That's part of the code. That's part of the understanding. That's part of the definition in their Webster's. Maybe not the regular Webster's dictionary, but in their Webster's, you look it up. Fighter, someone who overcomes. Someone who finds a way. Conquer or be conquered. That's, that's part of the deal. That, that's that's what go, it's not just about fighter guy who throws a jab straight a guy who throws a right hand and pivots on his right foot to shift his weight into the punch and not lose his balance freak that no that's not the definition in their mind fighter somebody who finds a way where others may not somebody who will bring a lantern of light into a dark place where there had never been light before bang that, that's them. That's them. They don't care if they got to freaking get sticks and rub the sticks together to make that light. But they're going to go into that dark place and they're going to bring light into that dark place. Not knowing what's there. Only knowing one thing. They got to go there. They got to go there. Because something demands that they go there. That they find a way. They don't betray that code. And I'm just saying, listen, this is a strong podcast. This is what we do. And it got stronger than I thought it might get. But I thought we might get here. And listen, Billy Joe didn't bring that lantern to that dark place. He didn't go into that dark place. And again, that's his choice. It was in a way's choice with fractured orbital bones to go into that place. That was his choice. It wasn't Billy Joe's choice. That, that's okay. That's, that's up to him. And he made that choice. But that's the truth. Both sides of it. Yeah, maybe he's smarter because he didn't want to risk the possibility of his future health. Maybe in a way, maybe down the road, in a way, he's uh, more vulnerable now. Uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll find out. I don't know. I don't know. I hope not. But in a way, he's a champion. In a way, he's uh, 
thought of as a pound for pound best. And Teddy, let's not just take our our word for it as co- as commentators of the sport. Let's hear what some of the fighters had to say. I'll read you some of the quotes from Twitter. Gabe Rosado said something to the effect that he quit, and someone said back to him, a broken eye socket. I'd like to see you fight with a broken eye socket, to which Gabe Rosado responded, I did versus Lemieux. I had a broken orbital bone, a detached retina, and I never quit. Let's not forget he almost got killed, literally, versus Canelo. And he didn't make the money, and that guy didn't make the money, Billy Joe. And I'm not saying that that should come into it, but I know, but but that I want to put everything into it, everything into it that that's out there. And I and I, but he's never made the money that Billy Joe made, and I. And again, but it was it's not about the money. Well, Gabe was doing it for pride. He didn't care about the money. That's exactly. right. It's about you. It's about who you are and who you want to be. And and how can you be that guy if you're not that guy when the moment comes? When the devil knocks on the door, what do you do? Do you lock the door or do you open the door and punch the devil in the effing face? Yep. Regis Progress comment. He could have continued. He quit. But more important than any of that, Let's hear from Billy Joe Saunders when Daniel Dubois quit on his stool against Joe Joyce, okay? I'm going to read you his exact quote taken from a show he did with the uh, Ak and Barak show on the zone. This is Billy Joe's quote, quote, word for word. If my two eye sockets were broken, my jaw broken, my teeth were out, my nose was smashed, my brain was beaten. I was not stopping. I was not knocked out. I was not stopping until I was knocked out or worse. I don't agree with a man taking the knee and letting the ref count him out. Billy Joe, word for word, had to deal with the same adversity, same adversity as Daniel Dubois, same result. Again, I don't fault him for quitting on the stool as much as I do saying how, what a warrior and a killer he is. And when the time comes, he's not home. Easier, no to say, easier to say things than do things, right, Ken? It's a lot yep. easier for people to, you know, to do this uh, than to do the other. And and that's and that's uh, using the stuff I was with my daughter. I'm proud of her. She's a lawyer, you know, so I think about lawyers sometimes. And to go back and use that analogy, there you go, Exhibit A. Exhibit A, right there. And this right was, there. like, very recently that he said this and... Uh, before we get off that, I want to talk to you about the fight itself. And one other thing I just want to say. Yeah, one other thing. You, I'm so glad you brought that up and you did your, your work and you did that and you brought that up because I guarantee you, maybe I'm wrong, but you're not going to hear that on any other program. You're not going to hear nobody bringing that up. That hasn't really from been brought up. Nobody's out there letting you know. And it's not that we're looking to attack a uh, Billy Joe. No, we're not at all. Put, this isn't look, an attack against him. We're just no, pointing we're, out what we're, happened. We're just that's it. We're doing our job, and I, I guarantee you, you're not going to hear that too many places. That that this is what that guy said. Now, what happened? What happened? He changed his mind. Uh, his when opinion, he was in those shoes, his, the exact same shoes, same yeah, results. Yeah, all that talk. What, come what on. happened? He got in to say when he. It's one thing to say it and to wish it and to think it and to be. You know, to be, uh, to romanticize about it, quite frankly, to say, yeah, this is what I would do. I be, Because, listen, everyone That's exactly dreams about, right. People romanticize dreams, those right? things. Everyone dreams about being, uh, uh, being a, a, a samurai. Uh, one day, I wish I could be a samurai. Yep. I wish I could be a warrior. I wish I could be that. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah, yeah, you, you think of that. Yeah. But then it comes time to actually do it. And be it where you never really thought in a serious way, in a serious way, you know, you romanticize about it, you visualize it, you, it was nice. It's just like we dream about things. We dream about hitting the lottery, what you would do. Oh, God, I would have a yacht. I would have this. <laughs> I have, oh, I bet. You know what I mean? You start, oh, it's so much fun. But the, then, then, uh, 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 Ding, what's that noise? It's the alarm clock. It's fine. Oh my God. Can I shut that off? I, you got to get up to go to work. Oh, 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 that's a little harder. That's a little harder than the dreaming. And, and it's the same thing. It's the same principle, Ken. You dream about being this, being uh, that kind of warrior, that kind of titan, all, all those things. And then all of a sudden, one day, guess what? It's a funny world. It's a funny life sometimes. Bang! You're there. 
Go ahead. You could be that. <laughs> there you are. Bang. You're, you've been transported into that place that you, that you romanticized about, you talked about, you said you were. Go ahead. Be it. Uh, uh, no, I'm not ready to be it. Oh. <laughs> Uncle. Oh. I surrender. Uh, oh. That, listen, and again, we're not trying to be, uh, even though it sounds like it, no. We're just pointing out stuff. That should be pointed out, you know, and, and, and as I always say, give the full view of everything here. And that is the full view. I said it from the beginning. Maybe he's smarter than all of us. And, you know, that's his, that's his, that's his choice to say, no, no, I'm going to live to fight another day. Okay. All right. Well, in this business, as I said earlier, there were people that they don't think that way. They think that a fighter is supposed to say, no, no, that other day is for another day. It's about today. How I will behave and how I will live today will mark how I am remembered tomorrow. That's how they think. That's how they live. And um, go ahead, Ken, take us to the fight because now we, yeah. we break down a fight. Uh, and I'll just summarize everything by saying, like, we have no personal beef or vendetta with with uh, Billy Joe. As anyone who listens to the show know, we have very few favorites. There's a couple guys that we genuinely really like, but I had no 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 skin in the game, nor did you, about who wins, Billy Joe or Canelo. It's not going to affect us one way or the other. If Canelo had quit on a stool, we'd be having the same conversation about him and his decision. And it's we about love the, the truth. Fans. It's about putting it's the truth about out the there. Truth. We're just and, telling and, and you listen, exactly what we saw. And listen, I, I, those apologies that the British fans are sending my way, send them to Ken to me. Ken will give them to me. You don't have to send them directly <laughs> to me. You know, <laughs> where you were attacking me a little bit saying, oh, so Teddy, you know, uh, you're, you're, you're not giving our man any due. You're, you're not giving him a chance. You're saying that you're saying Billy Joe's made the order for Canelo. You're saying that Canelo picked him. You're saying that well, Canelo is better in every area. You're saying there's no way that Billy Joe could win yeah that's what i said yes that's what i and said i'm gonna I, and i'll tell you exactly um how what that looked like in the first half of the fight by saying that billy joe showed up and put on a very good performance through seven and a half rounds i will give you that all day he looked good in spots as i said at the beginning if i'm looking at that fight who would i rather be I think Canelo looked the more confident. After two, three rounds, I thought his confidence was like a snowball rolling downhill. That's not to say that Billy Joe didn't land some decent punches. I never thought he had a chance to hurt Canelo, to your point, which is probably why he was picked to be in this fight. But I'll say this. Okay, you, I'll give this to you. Billy Joe's winning through seven, but I'll give you an analogy that maybe some weekend warriors can relate to. Have you ever tuned in to see like the Boston or New York Marathon and you see some lunatic amateur runner like me running in the front with the pros through five, maybe even 10 miles and you're like, who is this guy? What is he doing? He's running with these Africans. And every it, it drives me crazy when I see this because I'm reminded, this is a marathon. Okay. You can run very fast for five or 10 miles. But if the guys you're running with who are trying to win this race were running five or 10 miles, you'd be out of the screen. You'd be so far behind them. But they're trying to win a marathon. They're not trying to win a five mile sprint. And to that point, I would say Billy Joe went out there and he looked decent through the first half of the fight and was in the arguably in the fight. But to me, it always looked like Canelo was taking his time measuring him and that's exactly what happened. As soon as Billy Joe started to maybe slow a step and Canelo started to figure him out, you could see that round, that eighth round, where Bill Canelo started to take control, overwhelming control to the point where he was taunting him, waving the crowd on, you know, winding up on punches. So before people get too carried away with, oh, maybe a rematch, he was... Rematch, why? Canelo, in my opinion, did executed his game plan to perfection if they said hey it's a seven round fight maybe canelo wins every single round but for canelo it was 12 rounds to win a fight not to look the best in the first half of the fight and if you think about it from that perspective that's exactly what canelo did took his time measured him figured him out and beat the crap out of him and smashed him into into submission what'd you see in the fight i thought it was very entertaining in the first half Listen, it's not about the skill that's on exhibit. It's about the will. 
That's what I'm going to start with. It's always about the will. I don't give a damn. It's always about the will. Customato used to drum into my head. Teddy, when you have two guys that are supposed to be top guys, right? And they're, they're fairly, you know, they're, they're, there's some kind of commonality with, with ability. Some, uh, like both of them have ability at a certain level, at a high level in different areas. And it becomes a contest. It's not a contest of skills. It's a contest of will. In the end, unless one guy's skill is so far superior, like Mike Tyson when he was fighting some of these guys early in his career, it didn't matter. Tyson's will was never going to be tested at that point because his skill was so superior. It wouldn't get tested. It was kind of like a monster truck, you know, challenging a Volkswagen. It's going to run right over it. You know, there's no challenge there. Um, but... When you started getting to where there was guys like Buster Douglas, Evander Holyfield, you know, guys that had comparable skill levels, uh, abilities, then it was always going to come down to whose will is stronger. And it's always about that when you get into the square circle, the chamber of truth, as I talk about it, Larry Merchant used to call it. See, I make sure I give people credit for uh, for you know, whatever it is that they were quoted saying. If it's mine... <laughs> well, you, you're you alone on an island in that regard. If it's mine, I say, yeah, it's mine. I say it. But if it's someone else's, I do that too. I think that's the proper thing to do. But anyway, and Larry Merchant was great. He, he, he was great when HBO was doing all those years of, of fights. And when... So it's always going to come down in that in that realm, in that s squared circle, as I said before, where it's going to be the will. Who's got the greater will? And for me, well, I I was very strong on saying Canelo. I even picked the under. You know, for those people out there that made ho uh, money, hopefully some of you, some of our English brothers and sisters across the pond, you know I love you. Hopefully you've, you've made a wager, you know, you put a few... Uh, uh, and you, Teddy, you, be, be, before you go on, let me point out that we went over the line and it was minus 700 on Canelo plus 500 on Billy Joe. I asked you, do you like Canelo enough for 700? We both agreed, no, probably not at minus 700. It's a little rich. I said, okay, let's look at the over-under. Ten and a half rounds. I want to say it was plus money on the under, minus 140 on the over. And you said, I think if you had to make a bet here, the value is on the under. I think he stops him, and lo and behold, and I think you might even have said around the eighth, ninth, tenth round. I forget exactly, but we can go back. Let's go to the tape, as Teddy would say. Well, as I would say, but again. Citing the great Warner. Warner Wolf. Warner Wolf. Warner Wolf. You're right. You're right. We always give credit. You like the under, and I agreed with you, and we got one right, and I'm usually wrong, but you were right on this one, and I was on the bandwagon with you. We nailed it, and it was a good rebound from the, <laughs> from the Areola uh, Ruiz fight. So congratulations, and I hope people listened and jumped on my bookie and jumped on the under with us. Eliza, we're wrong sometimes, we're right sometimes. This time we were right. And we've been right a little bit more than we've been wrong. I, I can say that. But listen, uh, hopefully some of our brothers and sisters across the pond put a few shillings. Uh, shillings, I love that word. They put a couple shillings on, uh, on the a few under. A pound notes. Uh, yeah, a couple uh, on there. And for me, the reason I picked Canelo so strongly. I said, and I'll say it again, he has the ability right now, like Mayweather did later in his career, and, and I love Mayweather, so you know I'm not being disparaging in any way, but Mayweather was very smart at being a manager, choosing his opponents, especially later in his career. I'm not talking about the crossover stuff and everything else. I'm talking about when he chose Canelo. He knew he was too fast. He understood. Everyone said, oh, my God, he's fighting Canelo. Canelo's on the finish. Don't pick for him. Oh, my God, he's going to get killed. No, he knew what he was doing. He's very smart at picking what the fight should be. He picked Pacquiao. Very smart. 
and it was a no contest. It was one-sided. I know they say Pacquiao's uh, shoulder was hurt. All I know is Pacquiao threw both hands all night long. He didn't show. I love Pacquiao. Pacquiao's great. He's iconic. He's a great man. He, 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 he looks out for the people in the Philippines. He's a savior to the people. He's a hero to the He's hope to the people. Uh, he's inspiration to the people in, in the Philippines. He's a great man and a great fighter. But in that fight with with Mayweather, I don't want to hear nothing about an injury because he was moving both hands. He didn't show any distress at any moment. Floyd was just better. Floyd was what he was. Again, Floyd, as great as he is defensively and everything else with the counter punching and, and, and being a smart man, he knew how to pick his spots. I was saying Canelo has been doing the same thing. He's been picking his opponents. Maybe people say, oh, yeah, he's staying busy. Oh, wow, he's taking risks. Well, he's staying busy, but he's not really taking risks. He's taking calculated risks. It's always a risk you get in the ring. I get it. But he's taking calculated risks, and the calculation is like 80% on his side. He's smart. He's fighting this guy. I didn't think Canelo was a threat at all. I mean, um, Saunders was a threat at all. Now, I know some people are going to say, oh, yeah, but it was a competitive fight. You know what? I disagree. I, I say it was competitive to the to the to on the surface. It looked like it was competitive. There was only going to be one end result because I felt that Canelo was the guy that was controlling the fight he was he was dictating what was going to happen, what was happening. There were moments where Billy Joel was able to get off some combinations on the perimeter of the ring, on the outside, where he had to live to have a chance, where he could get off a couple punches. But in the end, there was one guy in control doing what he knew he was going to do. And 100%. 100%. One, yep, and, and, and one guy that, according to the rules of professional boxing, was was ahead where I disagreed with some of these commentators because I don't care that you're doing a little flash on the outside or shadow boxing on the outside. I'm taking nothing away from them, but you're doing some. Professional boxing is about who is controlling the fight and who is landing the cleaner, harder, more telling, impactful punches. And there was only one guy doing that. There was only one guy doing that. I don't care if the other guy's throwing flash punches here and there. Uh, at the end of the day, before the round was over, the other guy landed three, four, five hard punches that made up for all of that flash. Were there a couple rounds that Saunders had? Okay, I'll give you that. But I, I, I think that some of these commentators, I don't know what's to make the moment more exciting, more competitive, or they just believe it. Or a combination of both. They get caught up. They get caught. They get intoxicated, like having a drink. They 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 get caught up and saying, "Oh wow!" Because maybe they didn't expect it to be competitive at all. So they say, "I think oh, subliminally I, they want it to be competitive, and they know yeah. they're so seeing they the same be part thing of you're it. describing." But they're like, "Oh, we could give that to Billy, but we would." So I, I, I don't know if they him. know enough. I don't know if they know enough to know what they're watching. Uh, I mean, listen. Uh, Sergio Mora does. He was a former champion. Okay, he does. But the rest of them, I don't know. I don't know. I really mean it. I'm sorry. I'm not knocking them. I'm just saying that for me, there was one guy in control. There was one guy landing the the, the punches that matter in these in these cases, and so it it wasn't it wasn't quite the picture that they were painting. Uh, I didn't think. Again, I thought the picture was always what the picture was going to be and what I visualized it to be when I got on the podcast a week ago and said that that this that Canelo picked this guy for a reason and and he's he's better in every area and there's not one area where Billy Joel can hang his hat and say I'm better in that area or I'm I'm so good in this one area that it gives me a chance the the area of speed no, he's, he's not so great in that. He's not Floyd Mayweather. He's not Pacquiao. He's not so great in that area that you could say, oh, he's so much better. So you can't do that. Power. Well, of course, that's not a contest. No, he doesn't even come close in the power department. Okay, then I went to, what did I go to? I went to defense. I said, but he's not a ghost. I said, yeah, he's good technically. He's a decent boxer. His boxing ability, you know, his legs, his, his defense, but he's not a ghost. He's in front of you. See, that's what I based it on. He's still in 
in front of you. And what does that mean? Well, that means that you could catch him with a jab and you could hurt him to the body. That's what I saw. And that's that's why I made my prediction. That's that's why I I felt so strongly about it, that he's not superior in one department. There's not one box you could put a check in and say, Billy Joe's better in this area. And there's one great thing he does. He does a lot of things well, well, well. But he doesn't do one thing well enough to be able to win this fight. And the only time for me that Billy Joe did anything, okay, was when Canelo led him. Uh, Now, people are going to go nuts now. They're going to say, what? What did Teddy just say? When he let him? You mean he let him? No, what I mean by that, he let him by not using his jab. When Canelo used his jab, that was the key. If I was his trainer, I would have done the same thing his great trainer did. It's all about the jab, whether it's to the chest or to the head. You must stabilize this guy on the outside while you're coming in because... This guy's only chance, um, Billy Joel's only chance is to box. He can't win in the trenches. His only chance is to box on the outside. So that means he's going to look to pick your part coming in. That looks means he's going to look to be, he's going to have range. That means he's going to look to pot shot. You can take that away. You can take that out of the conversation by using your jab. Because when you use your... I used to say on ESPN when I was calling the fights, I used to call it putting bugs on a windshield. Put bugs on a guy's windshield so he can't see you coming. So you bother him. So it's hard for him to drive the car. And that's what it was about for me. I kept tweeting all night. My man Rob, he's the best. He kept getting him right up there. Right up there. And all you fans were responding, I think, well to him. Where, yeah, maybe, you, maybe it made a little sense to you. Because when he used his jab, when Canelo used his jab, he didn't allow Billy Joel to use his. He didn't allow Billy Joel to do the things that he needed to do to be in this fight. He he kept him defensive. He backed him up. He didn't let him back. Uh, uh, he didn't let him pot shot. He didn't let him counter. He didn't let him get off those flash punches. He kept him defensive. When he didn't use his jab, Billy Joel did something. He did a little something, but it wasn't damaging. It wasn't something to the level that Canelo was able to do with accurate, hard, telling, consequential punches. It wasn't that. Canelo was throwing intelligent, well-placed, consequential punches. Body, uppercut. He, By the way, Canelo, uh, over his last three or four fights, has anyone noticed he's developed a really good right uppercut? He really has a really good right uppercut to go with everything else. But he was landing good smart, meaningful, intelligent, well-placed punches. The other guy was just throwing. He was just throwing to keep him off, kind of almost like a cat and a dog. You know, you, you see the cat and the dog and a son of a gun. I've seen some bad cats out there where, <laughs> where the cats are scratch the crap out of the dog. But, it, you know, it's fine. Zalala! 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 You know, he'll he give that quick. But at the end of the day, you know one thing. The dog's eating that cat. <laughs> <laughs> when it's all up, he might have some scratches on his nose and have a you know you might have to put a little something on him you know if he's your dog i know you're a dog lover you would take care of him but at the end of the day that dog's eating that cat that dog's eating that cat and that's kind of what this was canelo was going to eat that cat he was going to eat that cat at the end of the day and he didn't even let the cat scratch when he used his jab so for me when canelo didn't use his jab then it was there was a chance, uh, but when he used his jab, he closed the gap. He shut down everything Billy Joel could do, and then he got to where I talked about why I liked him because Billy Joel's in front of you. No matter how much he wanted a big ring, he got a big ring. But he doesn't have those kind of legs at that level, like an Ali, like a, you know, like those guys that you know, all like a Penel Whitaker who's so good defensively, or like a Mayweather who's so good. He doesn't have that. He's he's limited. He's okay, like I said, but he's not great in that area. And I knew that you'd be able to find his body, and Canelo knew it. 
and Ed, and and Eddie Renoso knew it. His great trainer, and they knew that he'd find his body. So he used the jab to keep him defensive. Came in, put bugs on the windshield, and then he found the body and kept pressure on him. And as you know, I always say, pressure breaks pipes. It breaks people. And the pressure it takes time for the pressure. The pressure's not going to show up in two rounds, three rounds, four rounds, five rounds, six. But it might show up in the eighth round, and it did. Yeah, I know the eye, I get it, but the pressure showed up. It started to mount. It started to break pipes. And between the pressure behind the jab and then going to the body, the well-placed uppercuts were beautiful. But going to the body, what are you going to do? A guy wants a bigger ring. What is he telling you? He's telling you I'm going to use my legs. He's telling me exactly. I can't fight with you. He's telling yep. you something. He's telling you. He, he doesn't mean to tell you, but he's telling you, hey, I can't stand here and fight with you. I don't believe that I can do that. I need a big freaking ring, and I'm going to freaking run all over, and I'm going to use that ring. And so he's telling you that. So what's the best way? If a guy's going to move and use a ring, what is he going to use? He's going to use his legs. What are legs? Legs are wheels. What do you do to wheels? You take the air out of the wheels. How do you take the air out of the wheels in boxing? You go to the body. Canelo knew what he had to do. That's why he didn't give a damn about how big the ring was. He knew the guy was limited, how much he could move anyway, and how good he could do it. And he knew that he'd be in front of him and he'd find a way, big ring or small ring, to take the air out of the tires. And he did. And, and, he, and he knew what he was doing. He was in control. So when, the, when these announcers and other, whoever, I don't know, everybody's saying, oh, I was looking at it and saying, am I watching a different fight over here? Am I, there's only one guy going to win this fight. There's only one guy in control. There's only one guy who's putting hurt on somebody, who's putting a hurt on somebody. There's only one guy who's getting to the body. There's only one guy who's slowly, slowly starting to deteriorate this guy. You know, kind of like I used to always say, say Ken well, on a hot summer night or not night a hot summer day in the middle of July where you see one of those puddles in the street and it's so hot that the puddle evaporates I was I was watching this guy evaporate you know it started to show more in the eighth and ninth I know that the eye came in but I or no eye I or no eye he was getting to him he was doing exactly what I visualized he would do, exactly what I predicted and felt that he would be able to do. So at the end of the day, as far as coming, the analysis that you need from me, that's what it was. It was, it was about one guy who's throwing flash, shadow box, and quick punches that don't have the impact because he's not that puncher when he's allowed to, but then that's shut down on him behind the jab. It was all about the jab. For me, it was all about the jab and then, of course, body work and pressure. But it was all about the jab. When he jabbed, Canelo jabbed, there was nothing. There was, it was no contest. He closed the gap. He got to where he wanted to. He, he set the table and he ate. He set the table and he ate. And he went to the body. And, and he did a magnificent job. It was a deliberate job. It was, a, it was, a, it was just a steady, deliberate Patient, if you want to use the word patient, very, very solid job. And, and again, he's good at picking these guys. He knew this would be the scenario. As I knew, I felt that I should know a little something in this freaking business after 45 freaking years. He, he knew he picked that guy. I would have picked the guy if I was his advisor, but he don't need me. He's got good guys around him. And He's good at picking the guys. And he picked Plant. And I'm not knocking Plant. God bless him. He's going to make a big payday. And he's going to go out there and he's going to, he's going to do the best he can. He believes he can do it. Uh, he's going to tr maybe he'll do it. But in my book, no. It's going to be the same thing. Plant is very similar to, Ken, uh, to Saunders. Matter of fact, Saunders might be a little better in the physical department. A little bigger. You know, a little bigger. A little bigger. Just a little bit more physicality uh, to Saunders, even though he's not a puncher. Plant's not a puncher. Same thing. There's nothing Plant can do that's better than Canelo. He's going to be in front of him. He's going to box. And, and eventually Canelo is going to control him and get to him. And that's why he's picking these guys. Because they're the right guys to pick. It's no knock on them. They're good enough to be champions with a certain level. But not at a certain level. And... 
this level becomes that level that's that's one one bridge too far one bridge too far and uh canelo will put all the belts together he's got a plan the one guy again it's no mistake the one guy and i'm not saying he's afraid i'm just he's smart the one guy that you see that he is avoiding at the 168 who's that ken who's that benavidez benavidez there's a reason but but there's a reason to you the canelo camp would say he doesn't have a belt and if i were in the canelo camp i would be doing the same thing i'd be like get a belt but here's the thing once he let's just assume he beats Caleb Plant, which I want to come back to in a second, discussing Caleb. But if he does beat him, now we're going to see something interesting because no one's looking for him to fight an opponent next. They're going to look for him to fight a Benavidez. Does he step up to light heavy? Canelo's already said he's not going back up to light heavy. Or does he face one of the Charlo brothers? Those are some intriguing matchups. And he comes back. With- now listen, he can make an excuse. And listen, again, I'm just getting right to it. He can make a reason. I'm not going to say excuse. All right. I'm sorry. He could make a reason to say, I'm not going back to 160 because I built up all this muscle and, and I don't know. I'm just saying. And I don't want to uh, go uh, down. He, I don't, I don't want to go down. Why should he? Uh, but I'm just, that's right. But And listen, he's got a legitimate thing if he says that. He's put all this muscle on. Uh, he's put on all this muscle. And now it might be hard to go back to 160. But I'm saying what I've been consistent with saying. I If I'm going to watch a fight, as long as he's... These fights are, for me, setup fights. Again, I know I use strong words. People are going to say, what? What? It's a setup. Yeah, it's a setup to the point there's always a risk you get in the ring, but it's, it's, uh, he's smart. They're the right fights for him. He's going to win these fights. Where it starts to get into a little bit of, of, of you know, of uh, maybe choppy waters, maybe, maybe a little interesting or very interesting is if he goes down to 160 and fights the the bigger Charlo, the 160-pound Charlo fi- brother who's undefeated, if he fights him or if he goes and fights Benavides or if he goes up again to light heavyweight. And I think that's the least likely. No, of course. And listen, I wouldn't recommend it because I would make him an underdog if he went up and fought. But I know people are going to go, man, I love, hey, Canelo's great. All you people out there, you great fans out there, the great Mexican, the Latino fans, every fan, I think I give him the credit. He's great. But I'm, and he's improved. He's gotten better. That's the best thing about him. He's gotten better. He's gotten better and better, like a fine wine. But Teddy, he's only 30 years old. It seems like he's been around for 100 years. He's well, he better. has. He's he 30. has. He turned, he turned pro when he was 16. But what I'm saying is if he went up and fought Bevo or. or um, better be of. Better be off. If he fought either one of those guys, that's a whole different animal. That's a whole different story. That's a whole different conversation. We're having a whole different conversation then if, if, if he does that. Right now, he's the man. You know, it's, 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 his, it's his empire. You know, it's his, really, he's the, he, he puts out those pay-per-view numbers. He brings the great fans, 70,000 people. It was great. It was great. 70,000 fans. You know what I think you could see him do that hypothetically is if one of those two guys, if Bevo and Better Be a fight and one of them has all the belts after Canelo cleans out 68, assuming he can get past Plant next, maybe there's a conversation where you could he could be convinced to go up and fight one of them. I don't think he'd fight either. I don't one think of them I'd advise him. I don't think I'd advise him to do that. No, I'm just saying. Yeah, if I'm, it's I'm strict, with you. If I'm not thinking about the fans, I'm not thinking about the legacy. I'm not thinking about uh, you know uh, the the money. I'm not thinking of anything except Teddy. We we'll hired you for one thing. What is your advice to telling us where we have a fight that makes sense? Strictly, strictly, nothing to do with the things I mentioned, but strictly on. You know, him having a little edge, having a, uh, uh, his chances to win. I would say stay away from those guys. Stay away from those guys. Does it mean he couldn't win? No, but I'd say stay away from those guys. That's- I agree with you, but knowing how much Canelo seems to genuinely like be, love the sport and be concerned about his legacy, you go up and take all the belts at light heavy after coming, having all the belts at 68, and then to take them all at light heavy, that's, I mean, that is a statement that now, you know, we've talked about who's the best Mexican ever. Now you're talking about, wow, that's, that's a conversation where you can, he would be considered amongst the greatest ever if he can do that and beat one of those guys. So who knows me? I mean, you never know, 
But those there's a lot of intrigue. Wait, you reminded me of something. Last week when we did the podcast, I forgot to mention this. I'm going to mention it real quick. I was a little perturbed. I get perturbed sometimes, Ken. You know, just slightly. Um, but if I have a stomach uh, ailment, I just take this. You know, so I'm okay. <laughs> but I got a little perturbed watching this show, the Ariola and... Uh, I guess Ruiz. I was perturbed. Yeah, I guess I was perturbed because I was so freaking wrong. Maybe that was part of it. I was in a bad <laughs> mood. You know, that was part of it to begin with. But they did a thing. It was a nice thought. They did a thing where I don't know who the producer was and who the people that make those decisions and advise them and, and tell them what to do. But they made a thing on the greatest Mexican fighters. So they put up some really great, hey, look, it's a, it's a long list. But they put up some great fighters on the list. And I'm watching it. Because, you know, I'm looking and saying, okay, let's see. Do they have the right guys up there? And, of course, Julio Chavez, one of the greatest Mexican fighters of all time. Salvador Sanchez. He's my favorite. Salvador Sanchez died way too young. Unbelievable. And then they went with the more modern day, which they're great. Marco Antonio Barrero, great. Great. He reinvented himself. He was just a walking guy. And then he had another whole career where he was a great boxer, smart boxer. Unbelievable. Eric Morales, a warrior. Carlos Zarate, one of the great punchers of all time. Bantamweight, skinny guy, got leverage in his punches. I always talk about the wiry guys like Tommy Hearns and Bob Foster and uh, Alexis Arguello and Carlos Zarate. They get leverage. He was a great bantamweight champion. You know, so they they had they had those guys up. And I'm saying, wait a minute, how do you, who is the guy making this list? And first of all, you're going to go with modern day great Mexicans? You don't have Juan Marquez on there? Are you kidding me? You don't, he knocked out Pacquiao. I know he lost to him three times, but he also knocked Pacquiao out. Um, you don't have Juan Marquez on there? But then <laughs> I also said, wait a minute. How can you not have where I believe and and most of the older great, great, great Mexican fans and plain old boxing fans that understand and appreciate all fighters for their greatness, maybe the greatest action fighter, and this is quite a statement, Ken. Can you imagine I'm saying maybe the greatest Mexican action fighter of all, because they're all action fighters, every one of them, but maybe the greatest Mexican and a great puncher, maybe the greatest Mexican action fighter of all time, and he's not on the freaking list. It bothered me. Ruben Olivares. How do you not have Ruben Olivares on that list? I mean, he was a bantamweight and a featherweight world champion. Um... I, I I don't. It, it bothered me that you could leave him off the list. I mean, for me, not having him on the Mexican list when I saw that Ken, that would be like making a list of the great Yankee baseball players, right? I mean, you know, murderers row, yeah. the whole thing, the great, 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 great history of the Yankee players. That would like be making a list, and you don't have Lou Gehrig on the list, really. I'm not going to say Babe Ruth because Babe Ruth, of course, so I can't. Everyone, he's on the list. But that would be like making a list of the greatest Yankees and not having Joe DiMaggio or Lou Gehrig on a list. Really. You you can't have a list, a responsible list. And not, and these people, they sit up there. I'm not trying to make fun of them, but they say, oh, these are the greatest Mexicans of all time. Well, uh, uh, hello, hello. Uh, may I interrupt you for a minute? What about Ruben Olivares? What about, do you know who he is? Do, do you realize? Uh, the answer is, the answer is no, they don't. <laughs> I mean, it just, I had to say that. I, 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 I digress, um, but I, you know, I digress every once in a while. Uh, anyway, I needed to say that. Well, to wrap things to wrap things up with uh, Canelo, the next one's a tough one for me. Nashville Zone, Caleb Plant, my uh, my new golfing buddy Jelly Roll, the country music singer rapper, is. Uh, I've been playing golf with them, and they're super super close, and they're excited. I, I that's going to be a tough one because I think. I think Canelo's You're becoming so him. big. You're becoming so big, Ken. You really are. <laughs> no, no, you really are. You are. I mean, I knew you when you weren't, you know, quite as big. And you're becoming so <laughs> big. And I'm so happy. I'm so happy. I mean, uh, it's, it's. I just hope you don't forget me. 
Forget you. Forget you. You're the leader. Listen, I'm going to... Without you, without you, no one knows me. I appreciate that. I put... I asked Rob, our man Rob, just a good man. By the way, before we, we close up here and I say this, I want to wish everyone a happy Mother's Day. All the mothers out there, you're the greatest. Without you guys... Uh, we without mothers, we're not doing the show, by the way. <laughs> and you guys ain't out there to listen to the show and to to make nice, beautiful remarks to Ken and tell him how much you love him or or, or you know how much you love the show or to have the right to say, "Hey, you son of a." Bu- 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 <laughs> yeah, they do that yeah, too. <laughs> you, you don't. You can't do that without mothers. So, happy Mother's Day to all of you. Great, 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 uh, indispensable people, uh, the mothers, the, the greatest. And so whether they're up in heaven or whether you're blessed enough to have them here with you now, uh, tell them Happy Mother's Day and Happy Mother's Day from me and Ken and Rob to all of them. And I, I asked Rob to put a few things, so I just want to make sure that uh, the people understand. I, I had asked them when I was talking about, you know, the <laughs> about you know about the decision to not come out of the corner, you know, with all we we covered it with all this stuff. I I just you know I always attach either a movie to it or something. I couldn't help but think about you. Remember Charlie Daniels' band, The Devil, The Devils Do. That's a, I love that the song. The Devil Went Down to Georgia. Oh, there it is. Soul to Steel. Uh, ah! I knew that you'd get it, Ken. I knew. Well, you're in Tennessee. You're, you're into the music <laughs> now even more than ever. But yeah, on the fiddle. The, the, I, I, I can't help that, but to ben. think you. Uh, I uh. can't help but to think you're always taking a little dig at me with the Tennessee thing. That I'm down here in Tennessee with my cowboy boots and cowboy no, no, hat. no, no, no dig at all. No dig at all. You are. <laughs> you are. Clean those boots. Clean those boots before you come in the house. Clean them. I've clean been playing them. golf in cowboy boots. You got boots. a great wife. Make sure you clean them. Don't mess up up that house that she keeps clean for you and, and make sure you give her a special mother's day today but the, no he was playing the fiddle remember you know the words better than me ken but uh basically he said he said i'll take that bet i i say i you're take gonna that. regret you're gonna regret and because i'm and the I'll best play this. there's ever been I'm the best there's ever been. And he played that fellow and he beat the crap out of the devil. Well, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. That that's what you wanted to see. That's what you wanted to see. You wanted him to look the devil in the freaking eye and the devil shows up and say, I'll, I'll face you. I'm, freaking, I'm the best there's ever been and I'm going to kick your, uh, uh, you know. I'm going to break what, that fiddle over your head. Well, that's what I'm talking about. So hopefully you enjoy that when uh, Rob got that up for you. And the other thing that I wanted to touch on with the movies, you know, I always have a movie comparison analogy. And I think it's perfect, Ken. And I know that you love these movies. Uh, and the people, hopefully, I know they love them. But when I'm talking about, I get it, the risk. You could go blind. We don't know if it was broken, but let's just say you could go blind. You could this. This could happen. Uh, it, it's a it's a orbital bonus. Technically, you could technically say it's a. I don't know. Some people say it's a fractured skull because it's in that air. Okay. What? Okay. Whatever. Whatever. But people have done it. We just talked about it. In a way, he did it. He fought with it. That's your choice. That's your choice. And it's your choice to be smart, if you will, and say, no, no, no. I'm, I'm going to live to fight another day. Whatever it is, I'm not going to do it. But I think we covered, and a movie that covers it is Braveheart, Mel Gibson, where before the battle, he was asking the men, he was going back and forth with the horse, Ken. Do you remember that movie? Because it was magnificent. And he's going back and forth, Ken. And... I see you drinking Maylock still. Uh, but you you didn't make a mistake. Only I did. Oh, no. You got the stuff. You got the That's stuff. That's my friend. My friend uh, Shadi uh, Bakor at well, Pathwater. Well, well, we Shout get it out, out there. Shout out Pathwater. Oh, Saving there the it environment. Is. We're, 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 we make sure we look out for our friends. So in Braveheart, Mel Gibson, that, that scene where he's going up and down on a horse. He's got his war paint on and he's got his men there and they're facing 
They're formidable. More, more than formidable. It's not even supposed to be a match. You talk about a mismatch, this wouldn't even be commissioned. The commission wouldn't even allow this fight to take place. They wouldn't even pass it. You got you got all these guys that, that are there with pitchforks and everything else, kind of like the United States uh, when, when we won our independence. Very similar to that when George Washington brought, uh, the, you know, all those guys, uh, the, those guys with pitchforks and everything else. They weren't real war. But they knew how to behave like a warrior. They knew how to act like a warrior. They might not have had the rifles and the training that the other guys had. They knew, they knew what, they knew how to behave. And he's going up and down on his horse, and he's asking, "Are you ready? Are you ready to fight? Are you ready to fight?" And one of them says, "No." And he says, "No." He looks at him, and across the across the field is the British army and they got guns they're trained I mean they 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 outnumbered them 10 to 1 whatever the numbers were I mean really really and they're across the field and they're looking at them and he's, are you ready to fight are you ready to fight for your freedom are you ready to do battle with me and the one guy says no uh, no I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna live I'm not gonna die because if I fight here I'm, I'm I might die and Gibson looks at him. And again, I don't remember all the words. If you do, please chime in anytime you want, just like you did with Ch Charlie Daniels' band and, and with <laughs> the don't, words. I don't and, remember and, the brave but, heart. But, I don't remember but the he, exact dialogue. All right, you'll, you'll get it. You'll be there for me. You're always there for me. And what does he say, Ken? He says, yeah, if you fight, you might die. Yeah, but if you run away and you don't fight, you might live, and you will live. You'll live, and then years from now, you'll be alone in your bed one night, and you'll be wondering what it would have been if for one night, for one day, you would have fought, and you would have had your freedom, and you would have known that nobody owns you, that you're your own man, that you would have known that for that one day, you had greatness. That's, that's kind of what we're talking about here, really. Really, these fighters that make that choice, like Inoue, like Carmen Basilio, like Sugar Ray Leonard, like Muhammad Ali, that's what they're doing. That's what they're saying. They're saying the same thing Mel Gibson said in a movie. I get it. It's just a movie. But in real life, with real risk, yeah, it's risk. Yeah, it's dangerous. But it's also dangerous not to take that risk. To live for all those years and always wonder what you could have been. Always wonder if you could have had greatness for one moment. For one moment. That's what that movie's about. And, that, and that's what these guys live. You just jogged my memory. Hang on. I think I remember the speech. Let me see if I got the exact words. I fight and you may die. Run and you'll live. At least for a while. And dying in your beds many years from now, would you be willing to trade all the days from this day to that for one chance, just one chance to come back here and tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom and our dignity and our soul and our hearts and our family. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Let's go. Good night, everybody. So long. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs>